Stillness Flowing, The Life and Teachings of Ajahn Chah by Ajahn Jayasaro, narrated by Gosaka. Chapter 7 Polishing the Shell, Monk's Training Part 2. Parts of a Whole The Wat Ba Pong Sangha The community at Wat Ba Pong consisted of monks, novices, postulants, and mere chis, white-robed nuns. The majority of the novices were teenage boys, ineligible from taking full monk's ordination until the age of twenty. As for the monks, they could be divided into three groups, monks of regular standing, visiting monks, and temporary monks. The main body of the Sangha consisted of the first group, those monks who had arrived as laymen and had passed through the designated period of preparation before ordaining. This group might be further divided into new or Navaka monks, those having been in the Sangha for less than five years, middle or Majjhima monks, those of between five and ten years standing, and senior, Thera monks, those who had been in the Sangha for more than ten years. The second, much smaller group consisted of monks ordained in other monasteries and classified as visiting or Akanduka monks. At any one time, this group would include both short-term visitors and monks wishing to join the Wat Pong Sangha who were undergoing a period of probation and adaptation. The third group, usually only present during the rains retreat, consisted of monks who had taken temporary ordination. Lung Po made it clear that in his view, the only legitimate reason for entering the Sangha in a forest monastery was to single-mindedly follow the path to enlightenment. He would caution the monks, we're not here to become anything at all. In other words, monastic life wasn't about gaining any kind of reward, status or identity. That would simply perpetuate the suffering of the lay life in a new form. All craving, even for Nibbana itself, was to be rooted out. Forbearance was singled out as a cardinal virtue. To repress or conceal their faults in the world, whereas Dhamma practice opened the inner world up wide and exposed all faults. It was hard to endure. Remember, the practice is to look at yourself. Don't look outside, look within. Why? because we are practicing for enlightenment. Young men and old, we have renounced worldly work to come here to practice. The practice should result in the paths and fruits. If it doesn't, then as far as I'm concerned, it's a waste of time. Try to produce these results. Realize the paths and fruits. If it's not a big path, then a small one. Not a big fruit, then a small one, do it, and don't regress. Let the practice keep inching forward. Don't be satisfied with what you've already achieved. Lung Po said that if any monk practiced diligently, the first level of enlightenment, stream entry, was attainable within five years. He would urge newly ordained monks to clearly understand that they were embarking on a life that ran counter to old worldly habits. Everyone likes to follow their desires. But once you've entered the Sangha here at Wat Pong, you can't do that anymore. You've come here to train. If you become a monk and think you're going to eat well, sleep well and lead a comfortable life, then you've got the wrong idea. You're in the wrong place. If that's what you want, you should remain as a layperson and support yourself. 
it would not be easy for the faint-hearted. Only those who were fully committed would survive. Those with faith can stand it. However demanding it is, they endure. Whatever the difficulties and tribulations, they persist. Patient endurance is their guiding virtue. They don't just follow their desires. A major challenge lay in avoiding the tendency to identify with negative emotions stirred up by the training. Because we are unable to distinguish between the mind and the defilements, we assume them to be one and the same thing. This undermines us. If we try to go against defilements, then it feels as if it's we ourselves who are being frustrated, and so we don't do it. Becoming a monk is not an easy thing, it's tough. When outsiders talk about it, their words don't ring true to us. Take, for example, the common view that people become monks due to some disappointment in life. If someone like that arrives, you can tell it as soon as they walk through the gate. They're thinking that monastic life will be restful. But once they've entered the Sangha here, they find themselves under even more pressure than before, and eventually they can't take it anymore. That's how it is. I'm not just talking about other people. I suffered a lot myself, but I had a really ardent mind. I wouldn't let myself go on suffering. I suffered intensely. I don't know where the pain all came from. Yet, at the same time, there was also a part of me that wouldn't go along with it. In fact, sometimes, thinking about all the suffering and the difficulties I was going through, I even quite enjoyed it. Long Paul warned, that if monks did not know how to take care of their faith, it could crumble. Unrealistic expectations were a great danger. Many young monks disrobed when they realised just how much harder it was to train their mind than they had imagined. So the real, the best foundation is to live with patience. Patience is essential. You have to go against your habits of mind and trust in the teachings and the advice of the teacher. In fact, the practice that led to the best possible outcome, the long-lasting welfare of self and others, was straightforward. It only seemed difficult because of defilement. Everything had been well set up to facilitate the training. All that needed to be done was to keep the vinaya and monastic regulations, to follow the schedule, meditate diligently, and to deal wisely with whatever arose in the mind as a result. The point to be constantly borne in mind was that the goal of practice was to abandon craving. This craving. People don't understand it, do they? Some people think that once they've gratified the craving, it will go away. It doesn't. Feeling sated and experiencing the cessation of craving are two different things altogether. Give a hungry dog some rice, one plate, two plates of rice go down in a flash. But by the time it's on its fourth plate, the dog's completely stuffed. So it lays down beside the unfinished plate and guards the rice, eyes flickering. If any other dogs come to eat the food, it threatens them. Grrr. Dogs, humans, their instincts are pretty much the same. The abandonment of craving, the cause of suffering, would not be accomplished by force. Our capacity to abandon attachment to things depends on seeing how fitting it is to do that. When we're able to abandon something, it's because we've seen the suffering inherent in it. We're able to practice like this because we see the great value of doing so. 
the Buddha taught us to have mindfulness, alertness, and a constant all-round knowing of what's going on, and then to get down to it. After a period of sitting meditation is over, keep reflecting on whatever you experience. This will become a habit. It will form a condition and a power. Increasing wholesome habits is what the Buddha called progress. The development of meditation has to be like this. Some people are disappointed by their results in meditation. They start thinking that they don't have the capacity to experience tranquility, and so they disrobe. But it's not so easy to get what you desire. You can't force your mind to achieve a state of lucid calm. You have to be cool and unhurried, persevere with the practice and the teachings, put forth effort with both body and mind. Downfall in practice comes from not being willing or daring to do it, from not following the teachings, from a lack of faith. Monks were to learn by putting forth effort and observing what happened as a result. It was not so important to be proficient in all the technical terms used to describe the process. Lung Po drew an analogy. A lay person offers you a fruit, and you experience its sweet and delicious flavour even though you don't know its name. Knowing its name wouldn't make it taste any better. Visiting Monks More and more monks, ordained at other monasteries, arrived at Wat Pong, asking permission to join its Sangha either for a temporary period or for long-term training. Many of these monks were unfamiliar with life in a forest monastery, and few had received much instruction in the Vinaya. Although Luang Po was willing to take on monks ordained elsewhere, he was also aware of the challenges that integrating them into the community involved, especially the more senior amongst them. If visiting monks were allowed to take their place in the hierarchy according to seniority, then the Wat Pong system in which the more senior monks were expected to act as role models for the younger monks would be compromised. Young monks and novices might start to lose their respect for seniors who were obviously unfamiliar with the training. Luang Po's answer to this problem was to establish a number of protocols governing the admission of visiting monks, guests and would-be members into the Wat Pong Sangha. Initially, monks arriving alone would only be permitted to stay overnight if they'd been ordained for more than five years or if they had a covering letter from their preceptor. An initial stay of just three nights would be granted to visitors although this could be extended at Luang Po's discretion. Monks coming from monasteries whose practice of the Vinaya was significantly different from Wat Ba Pong's would be designated as visiting monks and not considered fully-fledged members of the community. They would sit separately in the dining hall, walk at the end of the line of monks on arms round, irrespective of their seniority, and, most controversially, not be invited to formal meetings of the Sangha. Most of these practices reproduced the way that Dhammayut forest monasteries treated visiting monks from the Mahanikai sect. However, as the monks being excluded at Wat Pong were of the same sect, the policy led to strong criticism in some quarters. But Luang Po was unmoved by it. He himself had lived as a visiting monk for months at a time and found it helpful in removing pride and conceit. The probationary period was not a comfortable one for the monks in question, but it fulfilled a number of useful functions. It provided them with an opportunity to give unhurried consideration to whether or not they wished to make a long-term commitment to the Wat Ba Pong Sangha. It allowed them to adapt to the way of practice at their own pace, without the pressure of being fully-fledged members of the community. It also provided the opportunity for Luang Po to see whether or not these monks would fit in. He could observe their personalities, 
how the monks dealt with their loss of status, and how willing they were to take on a much more demanding standard of Vinaya practice. Furthermore, Luang Po was conscious that if monks who ordained elsewhere, with next to no period of preparation, could join the Wat Ba Pong Sangha too easily, then it would undermine the system of training that he had developed. More and more people would seek to bypass the initial training as postulant and novice by arriving at the monastery after having ordained elsewhere. Ajahn Jan, who was to become one of Luang Po's closest and most trusted disciples, arrived at the beginning of July 1960 after spending a number of years in a village monastery. The contrast was stark and he felt jolted by a kind of culture shock. Being used to a more convivial atmosphere, he interpreted the reserve of Wat Ba Pong monks as coldness and arrogance. This was apparently confirmed on his first full day when clearing of the site for a new kuti. None of the monks seemed interested in helping with the work. Me, I didn't know about the vineyard rule forbidding monks from digging the earth and I just got stuck in. I dug holes, put in the posts and cut down the vines to bind things up. It was by no means the only vineyard rule of which he was ignorant. He had come to the monastery with a few spare sets of robes and a stock of tinned milk and ovaltine. He soon discovered that at Wat Bapong, the rule forbidding more than one set of the three robes was strictly observed, and that milk and ovaltine were considered to be foodstuffs and could only be consumed at the mealtime. There was so much he didn't know, it was a steep learning curve. When he tested my faith and respect, and he saw that I had confidence in him, he began to teach me. Luang Po said I had to throw away any spells, mantric formulas or empowered medallions I might have collected. He would teach me afresh. Right or wrong, I should just follow him for the time being and then discuss it later. I'd been ordained for six years and I'd never meditated. The things I'd been doing before, the building work, brick laying, carpentry, cement work, he had me put aside altogether. He taught me how to practice sitting and walking meditation. He taught me how to rest the breath, establish mindfulness. I was utterly determined to do well, and I did everything he told me. Just prior to the beginning of the annual rains retreat, Luang Po told Ajahn Jan that he was ready to be accepted into the Sangha. First, however, most of his belongings would need to be replaced. Monks commit offences against the vinaya both in accepting money and spending it. Any item purchased by a monk is considered impure and liable to forfeiture. Most of Ajahn Jan's possessions fell into this category. Luang Po told Ajahn Tien to go through my requisites and see what was unallowable, so that my sealer could be purified in the midst of the Sangha. It turned out that by the end of the inspection, all I had left was one thin lower robe. Everything else I'd bought myself and was in breach of the Nisagya Pachitya training rules. The inspection was very thorough. Even though some of the items had been properly offered by lay people, they were declared impure, incorrect by the vineyard because I'd bought the detergent that I'd washed them in. He had me send everything I relinquished back to my old monastery. Ajahn Tien gave me a new set of robes. They were dark-coloured meditation monk's robes, patched in a number of places. Luang Po said, Don't worry about requisites. If your sealer is pure, they will appear by themselves. After that, he made an announcement to the Sangha and then had me formally determine the cloth, put the robes on, and confess my offences. I didn't know how to confess offences in the forest sangha way and had to repeat the words after him. After the sangha had accepted me, Luang Po gave a talk. He talked about the various kinds of virtue 
and the dirt and impurity that the Sangha had kindly cleansed me of. He said that I mustn't forget that debt of gratitude, that I must remember it for all of my life. I cried. Ajahn Mahamon remembers the day he changed his requisites. It was my watch that I regretted parting from. It was a really good one, and I'd always used it to keep an eye on the time while I was teaching. As I picked it up, in order to formally relinquish it, the thought arose in my mind, if I give this watch up, and I end up going back to teaching, where will I ever get another one like it? At that moment, Long Po spoke up as if he knew what was in my mind. Oh, you've got a watch. Throw it away. It's not a good thing. Take mine. Then he took a travelling alarm clock out of his shoulder bag and gave it to me. That clock's still around. I've kept it with me ever since. Ajahn Bunchu was one of many of the stalwarts of Wat Bapong in later years who began their lives as visiting monks. When the monks and novices performed the daily chores, or there was a work project, it made me very observant. I helped out. I allowed my pride to motivate me. Whatever they can do, however hard it is, so can I. Long Po watched us a lot, very carefully. When I first arrived, I felt in great awe of him. Really, it was intimidating. In fact, I felt intimidated by everything. From all the rules and observances to the young novices, even the lay people, because many of them had been practicing longer than me and probably, I thought, knew more than I did. Although I already had six reigns, it seemed as if I hadn't even started to practice. Whatever I did was a mixture of the correct and incorrect, and sometimes I'd embarrass myself, but Lung Po would just let it go. After I'd been there some time, after the evening session in the Dhamma Hall was over, I had the opportunity to go together with some other visiting monks and novices, to pay our respects to him and receive teachings. If anyone had a problem in their practice, that was the time when you could ask him. Sometimes he would ask himself, how so-and-so and what about so-and-so, is everything going well? He'd ask us about how we were getting on. Did we feel hungry in the evenings, eating only one meal a day? Could we endure it? Sometimes he would give an exhortation, be very patient, just keep practicing. You're living with friends. Any task that needs to be done, or any observance that is still faulty or lax, then observe your friends. Practice well. Don't be heedless. Luang Ta It's common in Thailand for middle-aged and even elderly men to join the Sangha. Some decide to enter a monastery after retirement. Some after their children have grown up and left home. Some following divorce and others provided they have gained the consent of their wife while still married. The traditional term for a man who becomes a monk after having lived the householder's life is Luang Ta. Luang Ta's have had a poor reputation since the time of the Buddha. The archetypal Luang Ta wears his robe untidily, is still stuck in his worldly ways and is stubborn and difficult to teach. He finds it difficult to deal with the change of status he experiences as a junior member of a community in which some of the monks he must defer to are no older than his children. There is a whole genre of humorous Luang Ta stories, mostly revolving around the theme of greed or old worldly habits asserting themselves. In one typical story, a Luang Ta on arms round comes to a fork in the road. To the left, lies a village where he often receives delicious curries but few sweets. To the right lies a village where he receives wonderful sweets but few curries. After an agonized period of indecision, he sets off down the curry village road, but soon, 
swept up by a vision of sweets, changes his mind, retraces his steps, and takes the road to the Sweets village. But as soon as he is well upon Sweets village road, he starts to regret foregoing the curries at Curry village. He walks back and forth so many times, caught between his conflicting desires, that eventually he realises that the arms round time has long passed and today he will get nothing to eat at all. Monks resembling the Luang Ta caricature have always been easy enough to find in the village temples of rural Isan. However, this has not been the case in the forest monasteries. It takes a lot of courage for an elderly man to commit himself to the ascetic life of a forest monk. And of those who were determined to do so, only the ones who could prove themselves capable of enduring the rigours of the life and willing to live by the vinaya and monastic regulations were accepted into the Sangha at Wat Ba Pong. For this reason, the quality of the elderly Lungtas at the monastery was high. Amongst their number were to be found some of the most loved and respected members of the Sangha. As a means of gauging their suitability, Luang Po required elderly men to spend long periods of time, first as a postulant and then as a novice before becoming a monk. During this probationary period, and some elderly men never went beyond novice status, Luang Po would comfort them when things got tough, giving them inspiration and encouraging them not to be depressed by the frailty of their bodies. One elderly novice, sad that he would not be able to become a monk, was uplifted by Luang Po's words to him. He said that I had to take responsibility for my practice, but not to push my body too far. It was like an old ox cart, he said, falling apart a little bit more every day and not to worry too much about it. He said that ordaining as a monk is a convention, you don't become a true monk by going through an ordination ceremony, but through practice. He said that lay people and novices could become true monks if they practiced well. He told me some stories from the time of the Buddha about lay people who attained stream entry and about the one who realized arahantship and then got gored to death by a bull while he was still searching for some yellow cloth to make a robe. I felt very proud when Lung Po told me these things. And he was kind enough to tell me one anecdote that was really inspiring. It concerned a certain monk of a high ecclesiastical rank. He was a Pali scholar of the highest level and the head monk of a province. But he had so many responsibilities that he disrobed and reordained as a novice. In the hot season, he would disappear into the mountains to meditate, and then, just before the rains retreat, he would return to the monastery and stay with his disciples, giving Dhamma talks and teaching. Luang Po said to me, You can do that as well. Practice sincerely, at the optimum level for your strength and age. Don't look at others. Don't be a fault finder. It doesn't matter what others do. You're an old man now. Don't take any interest in the faults of others. I took Luang Po's teachings to heart. Temporary Monks Although there are approximately 300,000 monks and novices in robes at any one time, Probably less than one in ten of those who enter the monastic order in Thailand remain in it for the rest of their lives. Temporary ordination is the norm rather than the exception, traditionally for the three months of the rains retreat, but often for a much shorter period in these busy days. It's a custom that has done much to enrich Thai society over the past millennia creating deep and lasting links between lay Buddhists and the monastic order. Temporary ordination has prevented the Sangha from being seen as an elite caste and has ensured that few households lack a family member who is, 
or who has at one time been in robes. The value of this custom to the well-being of society is recognized in the allowance for those employed by the state, including members of the armed forces, to take full paid leave to become a monk for one three-month rains retreat period during their career. Temporary ordination provides a rite of passage in which young men gain the opportunity to study the Buddha's teachings intensively and to learn how to apply them in their daily life before embarking upon a career and marriage. In former times, a young man who had yet to spend time as a monk would be considered unripe or immature and find it difficult to make a good marriage. Perhaps the majority of young men who become temporary monks are motivated not so much by concern for their own spiritual welfare as by the belief that it's the right thing for a Buddhist to do at that stage in their life and that they're upholding a long-held family custom and most importantly, that they're making their parents happy and proud. The belief that taking temporary ordination is the supreme means of expressing the gratitude a son feels towards his parents is deeply embedded in Thai culture. Parents are believed to make much merit if a son becomes a monk. For some monasteries, a steady or seasonal influx of temporary monks can be like a regular infusion of new blood that prevents stagnation. At the same time, it may also disrupt the harmony of an established community. Teaching and training new monks can be a heavy burden, and the influence of even a small number of young monks who have no real interest in learning, but who are merely seeing out time for the sake of their parents, can have an adverse effect on the whole monastery. The difficulty in balancing support for a worthy custom and the need to protect the standards of the resident community were reflected in Luang Po's shifting policy regarding the acceptance of temporary monks at Wat Bapong. Some years, the rains retreat would see as many as a dozen, other years almost none. Generally speaking, if one year's intake had been disruptive, he would accept significantly fewer the following year. At Wat Ba Pong, the majority of temporary monks were government employees in their middle years rather than young men. Of these, the most popular with the resident Sangha tended to be members of the armed forces. They were used to discipline and physical austerity, tended to be highly motivated and fit in well. Problems tended to occur with the civil servants from a more cosseted background. For them, every day in the forest could be a struggle, and for some, the last day of the retreat seemed like the finishing line after a gruelling marathon run. On the other end of the spectrum were the temporary monks who extended their stay in robes for a few more months, or even years beyond their original plan. A few found what they were looking for at Wat Ba Pong and never returned to lay life. Nikaya Most of Lung Bu Man's great disciples began their monastic life in the larger Mahanikai order, and changed their affiliation to the more rigorous Dhammayut order to which he belonged after becoming his students. Luang Po was one of a small group of monks, its unofficial leader being Luang Po Thongrat, who acknowledged the generally lax standards of conduct within the Mahanikai order, but decided to try to reform it from within rather than reject it altogether. Luang Po Man established a number of protocols regarding the reception of visiting Mahanikai monks into his monasteries, as they were considered to be lacking in purity with regards to the Vinaya. They were to be seated separately, for example, and most importantly, they were barred from attending formal meetings of the Sangha, such as the fortnightly recitation of the Patimukha. The abbots of Dhammayut forest monasteries conceded that the Vinaya practiced at Wat Bapong was of a high standard but they felt that it would be disrespectful to the deceased Lung Bu Man to make an exemption to his instructions on their own authority. Thus, in most cases, 
visiting monks from Wat Ba Pong encountered the same restrictions as those who did not take the Vinaya so seriously. Despite being treated with great politeness and being reassured that it was merely a matter of convention, this could rankle. One year, Luang Po gave a certain Damayut monk permission to spend the rains retreat at Wat Ba Pong. At a meeting of the Sangha, he asked the community whether they thought the monk should be allowed to attend the Batimoka recitation. He silently allowed for the tit-for-tat position to emerge. They don't allow us to attend their formal gatherings. Why should we allow them to attend ours? was the most common response. Having listened to all of his disciples' opinions, Luang Po gave them his own thoughts, so providing a precedent for all future occasions. We could do that, we could exclude him, but it would not be Dhamma or Vinaya. It would be acting from opinion, personality view and pride. It wouldn't feel right. Why don't we take the Buddha as our example? We won't hold to this order or that, but to the Dhamma Vinaya. If a monk practices well and keeps the Vinaya, then we let him attend formal meetings, whether he be Dhammayut or Mahanikai. If he's not a good monk, has no sense of wise shame, then, whichever order he belongs to, we don't allow him to attend. If we practice like this, then we will be conforming to the Buddha's injunctions. Disrobing The majority of those who entered the monkhood at Wat Ba Pong did so without any intention of disrobing at some point in the future, but without completely discounting the possibility. They made a determination to give themselves to the training and to find out whether they did indeed have what it took to stay long term. Even amongst those who felt no interest in pursuing a life of family and career, few were willing to offer a hostage to fortune by declaring a lifetime commitment. To most it seemed arrogant and unwise. Who knew what the future held? The Vinaya does not stipulate that candidates for ordination take lifetime vows. If monks become unhappy and wish to return to lay life, then they are free to do so at any time, without stigma and without the psychological bar of a long, forbidding, disrobing ceremony. Leaving the Sangha could not be more straightforward. Disrobing is accomplished when a monk informs any person who understands the meaning of his words that he is abandoning his monkhood. From that moment onwards, even while still wearing the robes, he is, technically speaking, a layman. In practice, a short ceremony is performed. The monk formally requests forgiveness from his teacher for any offence or difficulty he might have caused him before informing him, using a short Pali phrase, of his decision to leave the Sangha. With these few words, he becomes a layman. Having changed into lay clothes, he requests the five precepts and some words of advice for his return to the world. A key reason why disrobing is made so easy, both practically and psychologically, is the recognition that few people have the vocation to stay in robes for their whole life and that it's better for someone who wishes to leave to do so rather than live on in the monastery in a half-hearted and discontented way. Miserable monks tend to make those around them miserable and their lack of commitment to the training easily leads to disharmony and decline in standards of the Vinaya. Few monks avoid periods of doubt entirely Consequently, understanding the nature of doubt and learning how to deal with it wisely is one of the most important skills that a monk can master. Until that skill is developed, and it may take many years, the teacher is there to offer reflections and encouragement. If he sees a monk's discontent as a superficial wobble, rather than a genuine inability or unwillingness to live the monk's life any longer, he will try to help the monk find a renewed sense of purpose. The teacher will be aware of many monks who left the Sangha in haste, only to repent at leisure. 
in the early years at Wat Ba Pong, Luang Po put considerable effort into dissuading restless monks from disrobing. As he got older, he was less inclined to do so, a pattern common almost to cliché amongst leaders of monastic communities. Helping monks to emerge from a period of dissatisfaction with monastic life was hard work, and more often than not, resulted in a postponement rather than a complete ending of their desire to disrobe. As teachers matured, they tended to become more stoic about the loss of promising young monks and saw the need to be more discriminating as to how they spent their time and energy. Some monks disrobed in order to take care of an aging parent. Some left due to chronic illness. But probably the most common cause for disrobing was the strong pull of the sensual world. Many monks found that celibacy could be managed without any great stress, and more than a few found it easy. But when lust did take hold in a monk's mind, it could be of an ogreish intensity. To those who were struggling with lustful feelings, Ajahn Jan remembered how direct Lung Po's words could be. Lung Po would say, really think about it. Women have got nine holes in their body, just like you do, and every one of them is filled with a different kind of waste. There's nothing beautiful or good or clean in any one of those holes. You sit there and you walk about daydreaming, imagining all kinds of pleasant things, but they're not true. You'll lose your freedom. You'll be under a woman's thumb. You'll lead a life of frustrations and strife. You're being seduced by sexual desire. Don't believe it. Don't disrobe just because lust tells you to. You won't die if you don't follow it. Believe me, lust has been deceiving you for countless lifetimes. He also recalled how on arms round, Luang Po would point out the sufferings of lay life to monks assailed by lust. The sound of a husband and wife shouting at each other. The sight of a tired-looking woman trying desperately to console a screaming child. Or of a woman, prematurely aged by a hard life, trudging off to the fields. Any such figure might be indicated with the words, Is that really what you want? When monks first ordained, they could be so inspired that the very idea of someday disrobing seemed unthinkable. But as time went on, their initial faith-driven perception so apparently rock-solid could waver. If monks lacked the resources of patience and endurance needed to bear with the difficult periods when their inspiration ran dry, it was staying in robes that might suddenly come to seem unthinkable. When a monk started to doubt his capacity to realize the Dhamma in his present lifetime, he could come to feel caught between two stools, the pleasures of the lay life being behind him, and yet no clear path to the profound happiness of inner liberation visible before him. The thought of reaching the end of his life in that unresolved state could come to seem intolerable. It was the classic monastic version of the male midlife crisis. Some monks faced no particular moment of truth, but it was as if their sense of vocation just gradually faded like a flashlight battery until there was no longer any light to see their way by, at which point they left. Disrobing was seen by almost all as an admission of defeat. To some, returning to the world after putting their best effort into the monk's life seemed like accepting an honourable discharge from the army after an ultimately unsuccessful campaign. Most were humble, they would say that they had not amassed enough good gumma to enable them to stay in the Sangha any longer. Their store of merit had allowed them only this much time in robes. Now, they wanted to return to a less intense level of commitment to the Buddha Sasana, to lead a good life as a householder, support the Sangha, and work to accumulate more good gumma. Like rain about to fall, Ordinations and disrobings of junior monks are such a normal part of monastic life in Thailand, even in forest monasteries, that they occasion little remark. However, when a senior monk decides to leave the Sangha, 
considerable shockwaves pass through the monastery, particularly amongst monks who are themselves caught in a web of doubt. So it was when the abbot of one of the branch monasteries and one of Luang Por's senior disciples to boot arrived one day, strained, pale-faced, with the unenviable task of announcing that he had fallen in love with a lay supporter and wanted to disrobe and get married. To Luang Por, a monk intending to abandon monastic training because of a romantic infatuation, was about to take a foolish step backwards and downwards. He considered lust as merely the immature expression of a noble emotion, something that should be flipped over into metta, loving-kindness. You've got to flip this personal love of yours into a general love, a love for all sentient beings, like the love of a mother or father for their child. You have to wash the sensuality out of your affection, like someone wanting to eat wild yams has to soak the heads first to wash out the poison. Worldly love is the same. You have to reflect on it, look at it until you see the suffering bound up in it, and then gradually wash away the germ of intoxication. That leaves you with a pure love, like that of a teacher for his disciples. If you can't wash the sensuality out of love, then it will still be there, still bossing you around when you're an old man. Sexual desire was to be clearly understood, not repressed, but investigated. Lung Po suggested, as teachers have generally done in this situation, a temporary change of surroundings. He made an appeal to the monk's pride. Reflect on the suffering of sexual desire until you can let it go. If you can't solve the problem with wisdom, or at least reduce its strength, then leave your monastery for a while. After you've re-established your practice, then return. When you fall down, you have to know how to pick yourself up again. You have to know how to struggle and crawl. When you've been knocked over, don't just lie there helplessly and give up. But once the idea of disrobing has become real to a monk, it gains an almost irresistible momentum. A sense of inevitability, which following an excruciating period of indecision often feels like a blessed relief, undermines the monk's willingness to question his decision. It was this sense that there was no longer a way back that Luang Po sought to counter. According to an old saying, there are five unstoppable things. Rain about to fall, excrement about to leave the body, a person about to die, a child about to be born and a monk about to disrobe. The first four are true, I'm sure, but not the last one. I'm confident that a monk can be stopped from disrobing. I myself once considered disrobing, and I changed my mind. In trying to puncture the unrealistic visions of the future that the monk had created, Lung Po could paint a vivid picture. Whereas the monk's life was untrammeled, he said, with the opportunity to go walking carefree through the forests and mountains on Tudong, the householder's life was cramped and constricted. Having a family imprisons you. You end up with the baby crying, your wife grumbling, your father-in-law scolding you, your mother-in-law hating you, hemmed in by pots and pans. Think about it. He reminded the monk of the difficulties of making a way in the world, of how so many years of living by a high moral standard made surviving in a duplicitous world awkward and painful. He called to mind monks who had left and, once the novelty had worn off, bitterly regretted their decision to disrobe. He described the pleasures of sensuality as superficial and fleeting, like the taste of good food on the tongue, in no way comparable to the profound and lasting well-being that could be realized through Dhamma practice. If you keep meditating until your mind becomes calm and lucid and you see the Dhamma, then you will truly be at ease. 
Sometimes you can be so full of bliss that you don't need to eat at all. And it's a profound ease, not just a pleasant sensation on the surface of your tongue. The fundamental message Long Po sought to convey was that lust and longing were not things outside the monastic training pulling the monk inexorably away from it. On the contrary, dealing with such emotional crises was an integral part of the training, looking at the suffering, letting go of the desires that fed it, freeing oneself from the suffering through the practice of the Eightfold Path. This was the very heart of monastic life. Whatever kind of suffering arises, then contemplate it, look at it, until you see it very clearly. Sometimes, when it's not clear, you have to fast and go without sleep and fight with it, be willing to die. Venerable Ajahn Tongrat once considered disrobing. He wouldn't listen to anybody who tried to dissuade him. His mind was made up. But then, one day, he asked for an axe from the villagers and started chopping logs. He chopped for three days and three nights until he was exhausted and his hands were covered in blisters. Then he shouted out loud, Now do you know who's master? He was talking to his defilements. Great masters have been through this. One of Lung Bu Man's disciples fell in love with a woman who regularly put food in his bowl on arms round. His friends took him off to meditate and shut him up in the Uposata hall. He fasted for five or six days, and then his mind flipped upright. He saw the unattractiveness of the body. His mind became calm and lucid. He saw the Dhamma, and he survived. Sexual desire is your weak point, and you have to remedy it with meditation on the unattractive parts of the body. Keep testing your strength until you know how much you can take. Don't let the defilements keep punching you on your weak spot until they knock you out. Develop more skill in meditation. If the defilements come high, then duck underneath them. If you're not strong enough to take them on, then, when they come at you low, jump over them and run away for a while. The decision to disrobe may not be completely irrevocable. Nevertheless, once a monk has made his mind up to disrobe, even the rhetorical skills and charisma of a master like Lung Po Cha rarely succeed in changing his mind. He feels a momentum. It's as if he's travelling downhill without breaks and is being encouraged to turn around and climb back up the mountain. In the case of this particular monk, after a short period of reflection, undertaken out of deference to his teacher, he disrobed. Little was heard of him after that. Perhaps he lived happily ever after. Perhaps he did not. Samana in the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta No. 40, the Buddha said to the monks, Summoners, Summoners, that is how people perceive you. And when asked, What are you? You claim that we are Summoners. So, with this being your designation and this your claim, you should think, We will practice the way of the Summoner with integrity, so that our designations will be true and our claims accurate so that the services of those whose robes, alms food, lodging and medicinal requisites we use will bring them great fruit and benefit, and so that our going forth will not be barren, but fruitful and fertile. Thus, monks, should you train yourselves. Majjhima Sutta 40 The word Samana usually translated as recluse or contemplative, is generally taken to be derived from a word meaning ascetic striving. Luang Po preferred to render it as one whose mind is at peace. At the time of the Buddha, it was the name given to members of the various religious sects who had abandoned their caste identity in the life of the householder. 
In the Buddhist tradition, Samana has been used as a synonym for both monk and true monk. In the Sutta passage just quoted, the Buddha refers to its first meaning as a conventional designation and urges monks to constantly bear in mind their responsibilities to act in conformity with it. As true monk, the term samana encompasses all the qualities that monks should aspire to. Longpur encouraged monks to dwell upon and consciously cultivate the perception of themselves as monks or samanas by constantly reminding themselves of their role and responsibilities and the goals of their monastic life. By doing so, he wanted them to cultivate a new identity as a skillful means, not an ultimate truth, that would distance them from their former identities in the world and serve to strengthen the mental factors of wise shame and fear of consequences. This perception was to give them a wholesome sense of pride in their lineage and of being upholders of an ancient tradition. It was meant to inspire them with the guiding ideals of Sangha life. A summoner's life was characterized by the sincere effort to study and practice the threefold training of sila, samadhi and panya in order to realize liberation and to inspire others by their conduct. Firstly, resolve to have victory over yourself. That's the main thing. You don't need victory over anything or anyone else. If you're always thinking of defeating other people, you're losing the battle of practice. True practice is based upon reaching the point where you know how to achieve a constant victory over yourself. Ultimately, if you achieve victory over yourself, then you achieve victory over all things. Establish this principle constantly in your mind. In a memoir, Ajahn Kemadamo summarized, And the purpose of our life we were never allowed to forget. We are monks, not for gain and fame, not for status and worldly advancement, but in order that we may have the best possible chance of facing our defilements. All those spoiling influences in our hearts and minds, seeing and understanding them and casting them out to achieve a secure, and lasting peace, the real happiness of Nibbana. In one discourse, Lung Po challenged the monks. What do you want? Wealth and respect? Rank and honours? Material things? We are monastics. The Buddha taught us not to aim at such things. If you're intent on pleasure, on fun, on an easy life and good food, on material things, then... It would be better if you hadn't become a monk at all. It means you're lying and deceiving the lay people. If you want all that, then go out and make a living as a lay person. There's no point in coming to live here in the forest, going without sleep and eating only once a day. Reflect on this deeply. Ask yourself the question, What did I come here for? What am I doing here? You've shaved off your hair. Put on the ochre robe. What for? Go ahead, ask yourself. Do you think it's just to eat and sleep and live a heedless life? If that's what you want, you can do that in the world. Take the oxen and buffalo out to the fields. Come back home, eat and sleep. Anyone can do that. If you come and act in that neglectful, indulgent way in the monastery, then you're not worthy of the name of monks and novices. Life as a monk offered great opportunities for cultivation of the path, but without the willingness to overcome old habits, it was easy to founder. If you accept the basic principles and try to follow them, you'll have a practice. But if you don't accept them, and just follow your likes and dislikes, you'll be heading for disaster. Even if you live as a monk, for twenty or thirty years, you still won't know the flavour of the Buddha's teachings. You'll be like the fisherman who goes every day to fish in a pond without any fish in it. However diligent such a fisherman may be, he's always disappointed.
day after day, he casts his net and brings in nothing. Recollection of the great masters could bring the mind back onto the right track when it wandered. Their attainments could be emulated through the power of wise effort. Read the biographies of the great teachers. They're singular people, aren't they? They're different. Think carefully about that difference. Train your mind in the correct way. You don't have to depend on anyone else. Discover your own skillful means to train your mind. If the more skillful means were unable to stem the flow of deluding thought, then a more direct approach was needed, whatever did the job. Once the immediate danger had been averted, a more nuanced approach could be returned to. If the mind starts thinking of worldly things, then quickly subdue it, stop it, get up, change your posture, tell yourself not to think about such things, there are better things to think about. It's essential that you don't just mildly yield to those thoughts. Once they've gone from your mind, then you'll feel better. Don't imagine that you can take it easy, and your practice will take care of itself. Everything depends on training.